Bonjour, bonjour à tous. Hello everyone, very nice to be here today with you in Paris. We are going to start the next session together with uh, our panel. Uh, the, section, the session is called Accelerating the Clean Energy Revolution. Everybody talks about it now. It's a really uh, part of our everyday uh, newspaper, television, and anywhere you go, you talk about the uh, transition that everybody is uh, hoping to see. Some people speak about a revolution. So what are the urgencies? What are the priorities? I would like to introduce you to the panel today. Uh, we will start with the uh, Philippine Tserkais, who is uh, from Schneider Electric. She is head of strategic partnerships. Uh, on the right, you will find Michel Sabon, who is French, and uh, who is the head of the R20 region of climate actions in 2010. Then uh, to her right, Christophe Sapé, who is the CEO of Navia, a company in the sector of mobility. And then we have Gloria Guevara Monzo, president and CEO of the World Travel and Tourism Council, which is based in London. So I think we are going to start with each of the panelists uh, telling us about uh, what they, how they view the situation, what, what, is, what are the priorities. Philippine, I will ask with you, and we'll start with you. Where do we stand? Uh, are, are we talking about a transition or is it a revolution? What, what, what do you find about that? What's your idea? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that's a, that's a very good question. In terms of transition, as you rightly said, um, I think today it's uh, very often, uh, every day you have headlines on the topic of climate change and, and energy transition. But what uh, we need to remind ourselves is that the reason why we are on this energy transition is because we are trying to keep um, the, the, the promise and the commitment that uh, 175 uh, governments have made two years ago, which is to stay within the two degree scenario. Um, and and for, for obvious reasons. And I think uh, today, if uh, everybody talks a lot about uh, what needs to happen in terms of what this implies in terms of renewable energy, of decentralized energy resources, um, people tend to forget that the solution of the immediate future lies in energy efficiency technologies because um, as experts estimate, 50% of um, the solution to 2030, which is tomorrow morning, I mean, which is coming up very soon, lies in uh, energy efficiency solution. And while this is a fact, actually 75% of the cost effective potential of energy efficient technologies remains to be tapped. Um, and so you were talking about uh, urgencies. I think we are constantly reminded that Although this is the case, we are in a state of urgency uh, in terms of climate, uh, the occurrence of uh, extreme weather conditions has increased tenfold in the last 15 years, and this has devastating human consequences already. Uh, today, uh, there are 65 million refugees, displaced people, and among those 65 million people, 20 million are embedded to the consequences of climate change. So it already has um, really important human consequences. And if you think that two thirds of the world population lives on coastal areas, and if, th that if we overshoot this two degree scenario, the sea level will rise by an approximate two meters, then you can imagine the daunting consequences. And obviously this also already has, and I think, um, You'll discuss this in more details, but this already has as well financial consequences, which are estimated yearly already to uh, around 500 billion. And again, this does not need to be the case because we have the technologies and they are cost effective. What we need is a willingness to scale them up and, uh, and to implement them. Just as an example, in the, in the building sector, which is in France 40% of the energy consumption, by implementing um, 
uh, monitoring, control, and automation technologies, you can reduce the energy consumption by 30 to 50% with a return on investment of less than three years. So technologies are there, they are cost effective, we just need to implement them. Merci, thank you, Philippine. Um, Gloria, you are the president of the World Travel and Tourism Council. Um, could you tell us what it is so we uh, have a, more, uh, a better idea of what you do? And of course, by the number of people traveling more and more for tourism, for vacation around the world, uh, it definitely affects uh, energy, climate change, pollution, everything. So what is for you the priority in that sector? Thank you. Thank you. I couldn't agree more with uh, Philippine. First of all, World Travel and Tourism Council uh, represents the private sector for travel and tourism globally. We have more than 160 companies uh, that they do business in travel and tourism around the world. If you look at the sector, um, we represent travel and tourism counts for 10% of global GDP. That is very important around 292 uh, million jobs. That's um, a lot of jobs. And by the way, 50% of those are women, which is uh, an important uh, number. Now, I couldn't agree with Philippine more because we depend on the uh, natural assets, of course, and climate change is a big impact. When you look at destinations that not 10%, but perhaps 40% or 50% of the GDP depends on travel and tourism, and they don't have the opportunity because of the storms of the impact of climate change, or if we don't reach the goals, uh, the forecast is that some of those destinations might disappear in, um, in, I don't know how many years, 80 years, I think is the forecast. So we are very concerned, very how concerned. How many people travel every day for tourism? Uh, you know? Around the world, uh, yeah. international uh, arrivals is 1.2 billion international uh, uh, from one country to the other. Now, when you think about domestic, it's a little bit over six billion people, okay? And that movement of people, of course, creates uh, 292 million jobs around the world. We're forecasting that in the next seven years, 100 uh, million jobs will be created in addition to the 292 that we have. And what's, what's interesting here in Europe will be uh, 5 million in the next couple of years. So that, that's interesting. So to add to what she mentioned is that uh, if you look at the devastation in the Caribbean, for instance, just recently, just the first storm uh, impacted a lot of our destinations and uh, 1.2 million people uh, were affected. After the second storm, that number went up to more than 3 million. So, and, and these are destinations that the main economic activity, of course, is travel and tourism. So we are very concerned, and at the same time, we're very committed. Our industry is doing uh, as much as possible, and, and actually some more than others, to try to contribute as well with the commitments from uh, the Paris Agreement and, and be responsible as well, because we have like two ends. In one end, the traveler, the millennials that, uh, for instance, the, we see that traveling more, the Generation X, uh, if we are conscious of our waste, the management, be conscious about the water, we, curb, we protect the assets, I think that we can all contribute to have a sustainable environment. Considering the uh, immediate danger for your sector, uh, what do you recommend? What is the urgency that you recommend to your members? What do you tell them in terms of uh, clean energy, is there a message that you deliver to them? Yes, we, uh, if, if you look at our members, we have a specific um, commitments depending on the sectors, uh, and the industries, I'm sorry, within the sector. Travel and tourism is the sector, but then you have the airlines, the hotels, the cars. And when you look at um, who contributes, unfortunately, the most, 93% um, of the contribution of the emissions, for instance, we have 40% aviation, 32% car travel, and 21% accommodation. Now, in the case of accommodation, for instance, hospitality, they, they have come a long way. A lot has been done in terms of saving energy, waste management, uh, water, and, and all of that. There's still a lot of work to Use be done. Use your towels. 
three years ago. That's just one example. <laughs> well, that, that's something but I'm sure you see when you travel. Right. I'm seeing she will mention some examples about the efficient use of energy. Uh, that, that's another one that is big, that you don't see that when you go to a hotel, if the lights come down, that's a very useful way to save energy, right, and be more efficient. So there are a lot of ways, and the technology is there, which is nice, and that's wonderful, and we should be using that technology more. Now, the challenge is the airlines, of course, uh, to tell you the truth, because in one end, we can say, well, stop traveling, but stop flying, could you imagine that? That means 292 million people without a job, and, and that's, uh, I mean, that's, there's no life without flights. But at the same time, the airlines are responsible and they're investing, of course, in biofuels and, and being more efficient and, and trying to reduce the, the footprint and having also calculators and initiatives to offset for that as well. All right, thank you very much. Christophe Sapé is from Lyon and uh, you are the head of uh, Navia. In your sector of mobility that it is developing very fast around the world, what is your priority? What is the urgency? Um, even if uh, we are consider considering now that um, it's a responsibility of government to, uh, of course, to support the usage of uh, clean energy, um, we have the responsibility in terms of uh, companies and industrials uh, to promote the usage of uh, such uh, clean energy. And among all these, these energy which are available on the market now, of course, the electricity is the main one. So. Um, we try to, uh, to transform on a very disruptive basis uh, the usage of electricity regarding mobility, and especially in the big cities, because uh, as you may know, 60% of the total population in the world will, re will live in the big cities in 2030. It will be 70% in, in 2050. So it's really urgent to, uh, to promote a new usage of new technology. And um, even if uh, main part of the consumption of electricity is based in building, for example, in France, 40%. Uh, the other way, uh, the other area in which uh, the total consumption is really important uh, for transportation, and uh, either on an individual basis for cars or in tra public transportation. So we need to uh, really to imagine a new way of uh, uh, bringing mobility to the citizens and um, uh, by using, of course, electricity, and among that, of course, electric vehicles. And uh, that's why with our partner, Keolis, with, which is one of uh, the main uh, transport operator in the world, uh, with Navia, Navia is really creating, designing, manufacturing autonomous vehicle. And the, same, the first uh, vehicle that we have created is an uh, autonomous shuttle, and we have now transported more than 200,000 uh, 200, new people now. So it's not, a question of the future is a question of uh, right now what we can do. Of course, our responsibility is to imagine this new uh, way of mobility, to make them happen, to, um, to imagine the product, also to, um, to measure what is our, the, um, the reaction of the public, of the citizens, and uh, to imagine new way of transporting people in the future. So it's really important to, um, and the, we think it's really urgent because uh, we are on the way that uh, at, this, at this time, it's no longer uh, interesting to make vehicle with thermal engine. Uh, electric engine are right now really um, cost effective. You don't know uh, all the different uh, repairing are very low in, uh, in electric vehicles. So it's very urgent to, to promote the usage of electric vehicle. We have kind of see in uh, all the different media that uh, all the different manufacturers are now moving very fast in, uh, in that area. And uh, especially with this electric vehicle, we are also bringing among this vehicle autonomous uh, software and autonomous side. In your sector, the, the, ma the main challenge is to product energy. Uh, the production of energy, we think, right now, it's not a real question because, for, of course, in, uh, for example, in Europe, all the different governments have uh, really promoted the usage of energy. You have uh, a large part of the uh, electricity which is now produced by renew renewable sources like uh, uh, solar energy and uh, wind energy and, and so on, or in nuclear plants, even in nuclear plants, especially in France. Even if some countries have uh, now uh, decided to, uh, to get rid of uh, nuclear plants, like in Germany, where they are uh, producing electricity with, uh, with diesel and, and so on, so it's not 
right, we think the right solution, but in large part of the world, uh, especially in Europe, especially in Asian market, uh, of course now electricity is growing very fast and we need to, uh, to, to bring new application of uh, this electricity. And, uh, and in your sector, is it a transition or a revolution? Oh, we think autonomous vehicle. Frankly speaking, of course, it's a disruptive uh, evolution. It's a real revolution. And uh, in other part of business, it's also evolution because in large, uh, large cases in, in big cities, now you are used to share the cars. So it, it will be a huge evolution also not to have so many vehicles in, in the big cities, but to promote the usage of the vehicles. As to say that will pay for the usage and not own the different vehicle. And so it will really change, of course, the car business. It will affect, of course, uh, the, the business of transportation people in, uh, in uh, big cities. And we are now bringing these new capabilities of technology to the different towns, all the different people which are organizing all the, your mobility in, in big cities. And uh, by bringing this new uh, evolution, we, we think that we can change the world. Yeah. Thank you. And now Michelle Saban, she's the president of R20. I don't know if everybody knows what R20 is, but she's going to tell us. But it's a very uh, new and important movement of the regions around the world. Yes. So you all know Arnold Schwarzenegger, and um, she's dealing with him every day. So how is it to deal with Arnold Schwarzenegger? <laughs> <laughs> and what, what is at stake for you? And what is, why are the regions becoming so, more, so much important in, yes, in today's very world? Important. Sorry, uh, Liz, I speak in French because it's more easy for me to, uh, to explain what so is the Please air use your translators on your little thing. Sorry. If you don't understand French, yeah. Merci beaucoup. Uh, D'arriver en quatrième position est très complémentaire par rapport à ce qu'ont dit mes, mes collègues de panel. Le R20, c'est uh, uh, pendant le sommet de Copenhague uh, en 2009-2010. Les régions et les villes avaient été un peu mises de côté. Euh, tous les gouvernements étaient euh, pré préoccupés tout simplement de savoir comment euh, ils allaient arriver à un accord. Mais par contre, nous, euh, régions et, et villes du monde, et on voit bien comment l'évolution, et Laurent Fabius a, a bien compris l'enjeu pendant la COP21, c'était de mettre au cœur des négociations ce niveau régional et local, pour pouvoir euh, être dans l'action et non pas simplement dans la réflexion. Donc aujourd'hui, euh, nous sommes partis de loin, le gouverneur de Californie à l'époque, puisqu'il ne l'est plus depuis, a souhaité euh, créer, monter cette ONG qui regroupe l'ensemble des régions, un peu sous le modèle d'Edgar Ford, que je, euh, que je veux citer, parce qu'au niveau européen, Edgar Ford avait monté les régions européennes, et donc sous le même... Euh, Topo, nous avons euh, créé euh, ces régions du monde. Pourquoi le R20 C'est face au G20. Nous avons pris les 20 régions les plus riches du monde pour pouvoir être euh, région fondatrice de, ce, de cette ONG qui aujourd'hui est fondation. Il faut savoir que l'île de France, puisque c'est elle qui nous accueille euh, aujourd'hui, à l'époque j'étais donc euh, vice-présidente de la région, fait partie euh, de cette euh, de, de, de ce regroupement de régions qui compte aujourd'hui 1500 régions. Alors, pourquoi cette spécialisation sur le climat et l'environnement euh, Parce qu'aujourd'hui, si nous voulons euh, respecter les accords de Paris, et notamment euh, toutes les, les belles décisions et les beaux engagements qui ont été pris, les régions aujourd'hui peuvent mettre en action euh, et, en, et en projet ces décisions. Je vais vous en citer deux, comme ça vous allez un peu voir euh, sur la question des déchets. À Oran, en Algérie, nous avons... Euh, euh, réaliser une usine de retraitement de déchets. Alors vous allez me dire, mais ça se fait partout dans le monde, ça n'a rien de... Mais avec deux par particularités. C'est que nous avons formé la population au tri sélectif. Aujourd'hui, vous avez 160 000 personnes qui ont appris à trier et qui aident aussi à ce que cette usine soit une usine compétitive et qui crée de l'énergie pour pouvoir euh, éclairer trois quartiers importants d'Oran et on sait combien euh, ces questions d'électricité sont importantes. La deuxième proposition qui a été faite et qui est en application, puisque nous avons inauguré ça il y a un an, c'est que nous avons formé 200 jeunes sortis du système scolaire, c'est-à-dire livrés à eux-mêmes, euh, filles et garçons, à parité, pour travailler dans cette usine. C'est un, un, un concept, un, un, un module que nous pouvons faire partout dans le monde. C'est du copier-coller. 
vous pouvez le faire à la sortie d'Île-de-France, dans une des, des villes d'Île-de-France, comme vous pouvez le faire du côté d'Abidjan, comme vous pouvez le faire à Oran. Donc ça veut dire que ce n'est pas compliqué à faire. Quand on veut, la volonté politique, elle s'applique aujourd'hui au niveau des régions. Et donc c'est pour ça que ce, 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 ce principe de subsidiarité qui est le nôtre euh, marche et marche bien. Mais en Californie, par exemple, enfin aux états unis les régions, ça représente quoi, par exemple C'est les États fédérés. C'est les États fédérés, donc voilà. il y a 50... Euh... Oh ben non, les 50 ne sont pas membres, parce non. que c'est très compliqué, les états unis en termes de relations politiques. Mais euh, ce qu'a fait le, le gouverneur au, niveau, euh, au départ de la Californie, nous avons l'État de Washington, l'État de New York, je, nous montons jusqu'au Québec, puisqu'à l'époque, Jean Charest était membre fondateur pour le Québec. Et l'exemple d'Oran que vous citez, qui est très intéressant, est-ce qu'il est destiné à être reproduit oui. par votre mouvement, oui. votre association Nous, sommes, nous oui. sommes en train de, 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 de monter des études de faisabilité sur les autres régions en Algérie. Et là, nous travaillons avec la Côte d'Ivoire, le Bénin et le Cameroun pour pouvoir euh, avoir euh, le même projet réalisé sur place dans certaines régions. Et qui finance alors, le financement, il y a des financements publics-privés, et notamment les financements, ce qu'on dit, des financements innovants. Et vous savez combien le président de la République a mis au cœur de la réunion de décembre à Paris cette question de financement. Et je, 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 je me plais à dire que nous avons un temps d'avance, mais euh, ce, ce temps d'avance, il faut l'utiliser et le concrétiser. Donc, euh, nous avons des financeurs publics et des financeurs privés. Et euh, nous avons un système de financement qui, une région qui s'engage à réaliser un, un de nos projets, enfin les projets sur lesquels ils ont, ils ont besoin, c'est que euh, nous trouvons les financements et ils s'engagent à rembourser au bout de 4 ans d'économie d'énergie et d'économie de facture les premiers euh, euh, remboursements qu'ils doivent faire en, en termes de dette. Ça, c'est très important. Et la ville de Rio, je peux vous dire qu'à la veille des Jeux olympiques, nous avons, en accord avec le gouverneur de Rio, changé l'éclairage public de la ville de Rio et on sait combien... La sécurité des personnes est importante par rapport à l'éclairage. Nous avons tout mis en LED. Et à partir de là, ils ont commencé à rembourser cet investissement, qui était quand même colossal pour la ville, qui représentait quand même un, un fonds important. Ils ont commencé à rembourser au bout de 4 ans. Ça, ce sont des financements innovants. Ce sont des choses que l'on peut appliquer aussi partout dans le monde. Et il y a donc un facteur d'éducation, entre, entre guillemets. Oui. Euh, en quoi pour les R20, pour le R20, c est, c est, ce rôle d'éducation est important, notamment pour les femmes Alors, Pour les femmes, je, je, je reviendrai un petit peu, mais euh, vous ne pouvez pas lancer des projets aussi importants pour l'avenir de notre planète sans que les, les individus soient concernés. Plus vous les éduquez, plus vous les, effort, plus vous les formez, pardon, plus ils se sentent concernés par, euh, par le devenir de, ce, de, de, leur, de, de, de leur planète. Moi, je, je le vois au niveau des enfants. Hein, on le voit tous. On, euh, là, c'est bon chic de, de, de parler du changement climatique. Mais ça fait des années que dans des écoles, et notamment en Bretagne, hein, euh, une autre région française en pointe là-dessus, forme les enfants au tri sélectif dès la maternelle. Dire que ça, ça se prend très tôt. Donc nous sommes en train de former au niveau des des régions en, en Afrique, parce que la, la, le, le regard se tourne vers l'Afrique aujourd'hui, mais il, il est important de, que, que l'éducation et la formation soient au cœur de nos processus. Sur les femmes, nous avons décidé de mettre en place un fonds vert pour les femmes au niveau régional, et vous savez qu'il y, y a un sommet Europe-Afrique euh, fin novembre à Abidjan, et qu'avec les premières dames d'Afrique, nous allons faire en sorte que ce fonds vert serve aux femmes dans les régions rurales, notamment en question euh, sur les questions d'agriculture forestière et les questions d'éco-center, mais ça, j'y reviendrai, si vous voulez, tout à l'heure. Donc ça, c'est une annonce importante. Il va y avoir la création de ce fonds vert au mois de novembre prochain, lors du, du sommet, du prochain sommet il, en il Afrique. Il est créé, il oui. est en, en, en cours de, relation, de réalisation technique, parce que bon, la, la, la volonté politique, elle est là, mmh. mais après, il y a tout ce qu'il y a derrière. Financé Le, par les États alors, par, par les régions par et les surtout régions. Par, euh, par les... Vous avez un fonds vert mondial aujourd'hui et nous allons nous battre pour que, comme pour la taxe carbone au niveau des régions, 0,0, je ne sais combien, 1% revienne aux régions pour aider justement à, à, à réduire la taxe carbone, euh, le taux de carbone dans leur région. Nous allons faire pareil pour les fonds. Et le montant du fonds est déjà connu ou pas Ah non, pas encore. Mais Alors vous avez une idée Vous allez attendre fin novembre. Oh, le plus possible <rire> Merci. Euh, donc, Philippine, vous qui êtes dans le secteur des, des grandes entreprises comme Schneider, 
I'm sorry, I'm going to speak in English, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> As you are in the sector of uh, big companies, uh, how the big companies are preparing this transition or are participating and what are their priorities? I mean, how do you uh, involve them? How, how are they involved? We see the role of the regions compared to the state and sometimes it could be crucial, but what about the big companies? So, um, I think uh, it was in a session this morning we were saying uh, innovation comes uh, at the intersection. Um, and I think in terms of accelerating and making sure this energy transition and, or revolution, because it depends on the sector, happens, uh, we need uh, increased collaboration between the public sector, the, f the financial sector, and companies. Um, and um, it, it may sound very generic, but it's actually uh, extremely crucial to make sure that we are able to scale up and deploy those technologies. And so, typically in the case of, uh, of companies, um, I think uh, at Schneider Electric, everything we do is to, we are a tech company, and everything we do is to support our customers to uh, move forward on energy management and automation, and so forward in this energy transition. I think what we are also trying to do uh, as, a, as, a, as a company and as a responsible citizen company, let's say, uh, is something that uh, a lot of companies actually had called for two years ago when uh, the government signed uh, the Paris Agreement, which is to, to actually create a level playing field to allow this transition to happen quicker, and that is by uh, eradicating fossil fuels uh, and, and every form of subsidies and also putting a, a proper price on carbon to make sure that we are actually taking the, the right business decision in line with uh, th this transition. So I think, yeah. Uh, are there big companies who do not do it today in the world who are not I mean, following the model that you are suggesting, uh, being in incentive, I mean, uh, tech uh, innovating and everything, uh, and, and are there companies who are resisting this change? Uh, I think in terms of uh, energy companies, er all the companies in the energy sector have uh, taken uh, stock of the reality of, uh, of the evidence and are calling for a price of carbon, if, that, if I've understood your question. Yes, I, I just wanted to know, we always talk about the fact that the role of the big companies is essential for this revolution or this transition. Sure. But are there companies who do not play the, 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 the right role in that matter? No, I think... Uh, the bad guys, if you want. Uh, or is everybody good in that matter? Is everybody following the trend? I think uh, the... Because it costs money, all that. The big majority of, of companies... Uh, understand the realities of the situation and have been calling repeatedly again for a price of carbon to make sure that the decisions that they are taking now reflect the, the sense of that transition because they understand again the realities of the facts and the urgency of the situation. I think what we are calling for on the other hand mm -hmm. is for the, the governments uh, to be able to create the right uh, call it regulatory environment or the, li the right framework for the s business decisions to be made. I think... Yeah, that's very important. Uh, Gloria, in your world of tourism, um, you, you have spoken of the uh, importance of the airlines, but it's not only the airlines, it's uh, all, all the, the part of the chain is very important. But uh, f for you, besides the airline, where, I mean, individuals who are in the world of tourism, what should they do? What, what do you recommend them? I think you asked uh, a very good question also before, and, and let me just start from there and, and move to the. You mean question. about the companies? Yes, I think there's a, somehow still there's a misunderstanding out there that uh, investing in clean energy and investing in um, sustainable practices costs money. And in reality, when you look at um, the, the experts, they will tell you you can quantify the benefits, and actually, there are a lot of savings. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe there's still a lot of work to be done in that area, but um, there's still the belief, and, and I think that probably should, you would agree with me that there's a misunderstanding that is just cost and no benefit, or, or and it's uh, the opposite. We have seen in the travel and tourism a lot of examples where they have invested, and then at the end of the day, it was cheaper uh, and it was better, of, of course, for the planet, but also for the uh, for the benefit. They save money. We have seen, um, to answer to your question, 
some nice cases throughout the chain, not only with the big guys, the hotels, for instance, have a lot of examples, but also um, with the startups. I was mentioning recently that um, in my past experience, I had the opportunity to work and look at the, some innovation ecosystems. And there are some inno ecosystems out there that specialize in uh, sustainability. And what's interesting is that once you train the communities, when they have these great ideas, for instance, Malaga is a very nice example. It's a touristic destination. They have um, an, an unemployment, especially, specifically with the youth. We were able to train them. And after that training, uh, they develop business plans. And as a result of that, 122 startups um, emerge uh, with the support with uh, green funds uh, as an angel investors. They were able to develop a technology. One example, for instance, was a restaurant that every night, uh, actually the following morning, they needed to pay the municipality to come and collect you know, the waste of whatever food was not uh, consumed or it was from previous days. And, and this one company of two uh, people from Spain, they developed some, it's called biodigesters. So they used that food and, uh, and transformed that in energy. And that's just one example of things that are happening out there with the startups and the small companies that are impacting travel and tourism. And like that, we have many. In World Travel and Tourism, WTTC has, uh, has something called um, Tourism for Tomorrow Awards, where we recognize the best cases and examples. And we have from Kenya, Botswana, all the way to Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, Europe, everywhere, great cases where people have go uh, above and beyond or have great models of sustainability and, and tour operators, restaurants, big companies, hotels, but great best practices that we're sharing. And we're going to be launching actually this year an initiative where we want to also recognize the best countries because something was very important here mentioned is not only the private sector responsibility, the governments, the lawmakers, they have to have the right framework in place because we have seen some countries that actually are going backwards, that before they were providing incentives for companies and individuals to invest in clean energy, clean green practices, sustainable um, uh, energy and, and practices, and now they are uh, actually the opposite. They're having more taxes on the green initiatives and not the ones that impact climate change. So the framework from the lawmakers is very important. Could you name th the three best countries in that matter? Who, who are, who, what is the top three? Well, we're working on that. We have a ranking that we have developed based on the research because we do a lot of research, yeah. economic research, and also um, and different types of research. But uh, we're going to be announcing um, very soon the one of the best countries that has the ten, uh, ten categories. Which uh, continent? It will be a surprise. <laughs> okay. be a surprise. Christophe, we talked about autonomous vehicle, uh, but there are other ways, other forms of uh, new ideas to, uh, to go in that uh, direction of cleaner energy and cleaner world. What are they? Where are we? Where do we stand? Um, at that point, of course, we are the, the, uh, the way we can consider the situation is, um, for example, in big cities, uh, on one side, of course, there are uh, electric vehicles that should be deployed and new services uh, dealing, for example, with what we have heard about, of course, VTC, with a sharing system of, of a vehicle. And it's really important to, to, to understand that the, new pe the, uh, the young people now, they, do not w they are not considering, uh, for example, the, um, the fact to own a vehicle has to be something which is very, really important for their life. Is they, they want really to invest, for example, in new, their new mobile phone or whatever it may be. So we need to, uh, to, to, bring, to, to give them a new way of mobility. And of course, in order to decrease all the different uh, carbon emission or noise in, uh, in the cities, we need to, uh, uh, to bring this new vehicle in, in the cities. For that, we need to uh, establish a new partnership between public and, uh, and pri uh, private companies. Because for example, the, new, the first line that we have developed uh, for example, in Lyon, it was a public-private partnership between the, the city of Lyon with Keolis uh, transportation operator with uh, Navia, which is designing the vehicle. And all these things makes 
it's possible to uh, to provide new services to the to the citizens and um, in other side, what we can also uh, think about is all the different technologies that can be brought to the to the to the city in order to to ease uh, the, the life of of other citizens and to to make it m more sure uh, because uh, of course in uh, in some cases it, it's very dangerous. Merci, Christophe. Uh, as we are approaching the end of the session, I would like to ask each, uh, each of the panelists the last word, and to start with Philippine. What what did you? Uh, I mean, what, what, will you, uh, what would you say? First of all, if I may, I would like to reiterate uh, what Gloria said uh, and, and not leave uh, the audience with a misunderstanding because you said repeatedly there is a cost. Yes, there is an upfront cost, but it's also benefits. What I said, but I didn't probably emphasize enough, is that uh, we have today, and even more so with the, with the conversions of IT technologies uh, in, 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 and OT technologies, we have return on investments that are extremely quick. So we have savings, actually, in terms of utility bills, for instance, uh, through software and through connected devices for a huge uh, retail customers, we were able to implement 100 million savings on their 600 million uh, utility bills. So it is savings. Uh, so it's not only good for the climate, it's only not only a necessity, it's also good financially, and it, it's also good in terms of, of job creation that you had been mentioning earlier. So I think uh, in a concluding word, I would say technologies are there. What we are really uh, calling for, and uh, you referenced earlier to the Climate Finance Summit in December, I think what would be a great goal for uh, President Macron and the, the rest of uh, the, the, the governments attending uh, that, uh, that summit would be to put a price on carbon. Merci. Michel Saban, votre mot de la fin de Alors, moi, je voudrais finir sur les femmes, puisque c'est quand même euh, ces thèmes qui, euh, aujourd'hui, nous guident euh, sur, cette, euh, sur ces deux journées de, de conférences. Moi, je pense que quand on parle d'éducation et de formation, euh, nous, nous avons des programmes de riches ici. Euh, mais il faut aller dans les, dans les continents, dans les pays où euh, la question euh, du climat est presque secondaire. La question qui est prioritaire, c'est de vivre, de, de, de manger. Mais on peut allier les deux. On peut allier le climat, le changement climatique, l'environnement, et euh, réduire la pauvreté dans le monde. Et donc, à partir de là, euh, c'est tout l'enjeu du, du fond vert pour les femmes. C'est Si nous voulons parler d'indépendance et d'autonomisation des femmes, il faut parler d'éducation et de formation. On ne peut plus faire comme à une époque où on arrivait, on construisait des choses et on repartait, et on laissait les populations livrer à elles-mêmes. Il faut savoir prendre le temps et euh, se donner le temps d'éduquer, de former. Ça veut dire que, euh, sur la question de l'environnement, il ne faut pas simplement dire que la désertification crée des, po des poches d'insécurité de, de, euh, de, de, totale dans certaines régions du monde, et notamment en Afrique. Il faut réduire euh, la pauvreté pour éviter, justement, de créer ces poches d'insécurité et de, et de violence. Les femmes, aujourd'hui, en Afrique, ont pris leur euh, destin en main, je veux dire. Je fais court. Mais ce que, au travers de ce fonds, ce que nous voulons faire, c'est justement... Euh, il y a une formule qui est très belle. Je finirai par là. J'ai assisté à une réunion de la diaspora des femmes africaines. L'or rose de l'Afrique, ce sont les femmes. Et vous l'avez tout compris. Merci, Michel Saban. Christophe, le mot de la fin. Um, In English. Um, what I think is a transition with, uh, which is involved by this... Um, new clean tech and then new clean energy has to be considered as to be an opportunity, opportunity not to be constrained because of course uh, on a long term basis it gives more security, it gives more saving and uh, it's really important to, um, to, to, to take this opportunity to reinvent our world and to give some new services and some new ways of to bring electricity in Africa some uh, everything that we, is now possible to raised all the money which is necessary because of course money is really the essence of uh, develop development if you, you have no money generally speaking it's very difficult to make something and um, it's really interesting to see that all the technology are now uh, there together we have only to consider that to make to take the best of all the technology and to bring new services to the population and i think it's really important
Thank you. And the very, very last word to you, Gloria. Thank you. Um, I think um, climate change is impacting the planet. We see that every day. I mean, just need to turn on the, your TV or, or look at the internet and see the impact in the Caribbean, in Asia, and here in Europe, and, and the weather is impacting everyone. I truly believe that this transformation or revolution is responsibly for everyone. From, we see that from the traveler, be careful with the waste, the water, the electricity, while you're traveling, make sure that you protect the natural assets that that country or that destination has. It's responsibility for the travel industry, the provider, the airlines, the hotels, tour operators, the cars. But it's also responsibility for the tourism sector, which includes, of course, the governments, the lawmakers, and, and the leaders. So if we all can contribute, I think that we can make an impact. It can really make this transformation possible. But all the parties have to do it together. That's my belief. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists, and thank you to you to be here. And uh, you can address the panelists at the end in the, in the back room if you need uh, to have any questions. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.